Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll try to be a nice guy um, from the podium. Um, thanks all for coming. Uh, that's great. I thought I would talk about the tricky stuff, um, and I would talk... I wasn't quite expecting so many faces, so that's great. Um, I thought I would talk about localising in tricky places. Uh, so I've spent... Um, I guess I've been working on localization for 20 years, so I don't know if that makes me good at it or, or, or really bad at it. Um, um, I'm going to go with somewhere in between for now, and you can judge. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been really interested for a long time in knowing where machine, having machines know where they are all the time, wherever, whenever, whatever the weather is a moniker I use. So I thought I'd walk you through some, some of that and, and some of our current thinking. So this is a, a tableau of videos um, uh, driving around Oxford in the Oxford 10K data set. And if you stop it, that's all the same place. So they've all been synchronized. They've been synchronized actually by, by a navigation algorithm. Now, as a human, this is no problem for us. And every one of these places is the same. But look at this appearance change that we get between these guys. So this is the same place as this. Um, notice there are very few sunny images in there, but that tells you something about my life. Um, um, meta not metaphorically. Um, so, you know, we demand wherever, whenever, whatever the weather. And, and how do we do that? So, um, now some of you have heard of some of the base techniques that we use, but I thought I'd spend just a few minutes uh, opening up, uh, talking about some of those, those techniques. So, first of all, um, we don't use a global coordinate frame. Okay, so I don't think it makes sense to write down where my house is with respect to here in coordinates X, Y, Z. Okay, so so we, we build our localization systems from something we call topometric. So a topometric map uh, is a graph structure that you're used to. And if I localize myself at one node in the graph, I can expand from a node search and build up a metric representation local to where I am, sort of robocentric, Oh, I don't know, maybe of like five, six hundred meters around me that's going to be good metrically, but over a thousand kilometers, it makes no sense at all. But that's okay because I have a graph to move through. So we're all used to the topological maps of the London Underground that talk about connectivity. This is just an extension where the nodes between graphs, uh, between, sorry, the edges between graph nodes uh, are not just a link, they also have a rigid body transform in them as well. Um, and then loop closures, and I spent a time thinking about how do you recognize you're back at the same place, simply as a pointer between two nodes. Again, with a metric constraint on it, but globally it makes no sense. And so you can trace this thinking um, uh, back to the Atlas framework with, with Mike Bossa uh, and, and John Leonard, um, and then through some work I did with, with Gabe Sibley. Um, so, I mean, I, I, it's always good to put an Escher picture up. I, they're so confusing. Um, but, but that really is how we think of the world. Um, locally, pick one of those steps, everything makes sense metrically locally, and it's only when you step back globally, something's wrong. But very, very rarely do I need that global picture. Okay? I only need that for plotting shortcuts. So locally, I can take actions at any point on that staircase. And that makes a really big difference to the scaling problem for us, because we never have to do a big adjustment over all coordinate frames. And, you know, Gabe Sibley used to say, how could you get in a lift if you had a global coordinate frame? Or how could you be in a train? If you had a global coordinate frame, because you're sitting locally, nothing's moving relative to you, but you're moving yourself. So, not that we really want to, to, to navigate in buses, but I think, I think that picture about not insisting on a single global coordinate frame is super, super important. It's made a huge difference. It's one of the things that we pull together. Um, and I think you can think about this topometric thing as sort of localizing on a sphere, and you could project down onto a plane if you wanted to write an ICRA paper. Okay, and you needed to have only 2D graph paper because the 3D stuff's really expensive still. Um, and, and so, you know, we think about it like that, and we, you know, so you're, you're really uh, navigating on, on a manifold. Second thing that I think is really important is the experience-based uh, paradigm. So previously, um, in, in earlier lives, I'd be trying to come up with one state, one latent state to explain the whole world, to explain all the images I've seen. And there was a blizzard in Oxford, which is pretty rare, and it changed everything that day. And I remember talking to, to Winston Churchill about this, and we decided that, and it, you know, it sort of picked up some work from, from Tim Barfoot as well, that, that places have multiple experiences. They have multiple faces. So, uh, you know, my front, my front yard looks different in August to it does in a frosty January morning, okay? Completely different. So remember those two faces. Let's have two pictures of, of that front yard. 
And then when I'm trying to localise, say, oh, is it a frosty day, is it a sunny day? And localise with respect to the two, rather than trying to come up with some underlying state that explains both frost and sun, or snow, or rain. Um, no mention, I make no mention of sun. Um, so, so, okay, so let's, let's imagine that experience one is Monday, um, and I'm going to move through the world, and uh, I'm trying to localise, but I have no experience of the world. So Monday is experience one. These nodes, they represent pictures that I've taken and have rigid body transformations from each of those nodes. So I'm going to write down that's the Monday experience. So, okay, so I haven't been able to do any localization. I've just gone through the world once. It's my first visit to the Brisbane Convention System, um, uh, Centre, and what a visit it is. Okay, I go out on, uh, on Tuesday, experience two, and I take my first picture, and I'm lucky because my first picture, I can relate to the first picture I took on Monday, so I'm localised. But then something extraordinary happens. On my next picture that I take, it snowed on Monday. I don't know why. Okay, this is pedagogical. It doesn't really happen like this, but you, 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 get, the, you get the idea. So I cannot associate my second picture with any pictures I took on Monday. So now I've got two experiences that seem different of this place. So this column here has a snowy face and a sunny face. Same for the third column, but the fourth column I can localise with respect to where I was on the last picture on Monday. And Wednesday's a very special day, and I go through, and I'm able to associate every picture with something I've seen before. But here's a clever thing. Notice that this area of this map has naturally built up two representations of itself, because it is visually diverse. So instead of coming up with some underlying state for both of these places, I say, well, it's got two confusing faces. I'll keep both of them. It makes a really big difference. So this is, looks way old now, but this is quite a nice sort of diagram of us. We went out for three months around a little loop. This is only about a kilometer. And I've color coded it here by the number of experiences. So down here, we call this the corner of doom because it's full of doom. Um, and I'll come to more why that's doomful in a moment. But down here, it needed quite a few experiences to go through. So back in the day there, it needed like 20 times to drive through it. Well, much less than that now. Um, but over here, it was mostly in shadow a lot of the time, very few experiences. So this is a map that's richer in the places of greater visual diversity and sparser in the simpler places. Okay. So that all sounds great, and here we are down at the corner of Doom, okay? And it was doomful because there was a crazy guy on a tractor that kept coming around head on to us. But the other thing that made it tricky was look at the sunlight dappling through those trees. Now, for a visual localization system, that's bad news, right? Because the texture on the road is really, really interesting. And about this time, uh, Peter Court came to stay, and we started thinking about color. Um, and, and shadows, and did some interesting work on removing the shadows. And I would recommend everyone puts this next line of MATLAB code, or C code, or C++, uh, in, their, in, their, uh, in their code, because it's a simple thing. And, okay, so here's the idea. I want to remove shadows, and that seems quite hard, because I don't know anything about the world, which I'm going to represent the entire world with a tree. Okay, this is the entire world. And I'm going to represent the geometry of the world with a dot product. It's a pretty simple world I live in, okay? But you get the sense. Now, here's the thing up here. The sun I do know a lot about, because Boltzmann said many true things about the sun. And I know it's, I know it's temperature. So, and I also know an awful lot about cameras because I make them, okay? And they come with manuals, okay? So I can do an integral. So I can say, well, the color that I'm going to receive on channel I, which would be red, green, or blue, is something to do with the geometry times the amount of energy coming out times some crazy integral, which is the uh, energy released by the sun as a spectrum, the crazy stuff that happens because of surfaces, so that's a filter, and then a filter in the camera that is the reception characteristics I have for different wavelengths in the camera. So that looks, uh, that looks fine only I don't know any of these things. And then you do this filthy trick. And, um, and this really comes from some of McGinnity's work here, is that if I were to replace the reception fields of this camera, instead of being continuous, and say, actually, there's a delta Dirac on one frequency for red, one frequency for green, and one frequency for blue, that integral becomes an integral over delta Dirac, which so smashes the integral, and you get a sum. Okay? And you can write down a couple of constraints, and Will Madden was, was instrumental in this. Um, and it's extraordinary. So log is always a good function. When you see that, you're feeling good. Um, and uh, so I can take, it's extraordinary, right? So I take three logs of the intensities on the red, green, and blue channels, combine them with respect to one constraint, and these alphas and betas come from your manual, from your camera. 
and you can convert red, green, blue channel images into a slightly noisy grayscale image. But look, all the shadows have gone. Yeah, so look at the shadow on this wood building here. That maps to here, and that maps to here. These are identical. And when we looked at this and we thought, oh, it's not really working on the shadow here, but that's actually, uh, that actually there is uh, material properties. Okay, so it's a different kind of tarmac. Okay, so, and here's that corner of doom. All the shadows have been suppressed. So when you stick all those things together, you get quite remarkable um, effects um, in, in bright daylight. Um, you can run these two systems side by side, so you can have the red, green, blue system for your odometry and your localization running next to your, um, your uh, other system, uh, your, your shadow removal system. And if you drive for about 1,000 kilometers, we drove 1,000 kilometers, these are the kind of errors that you get. So we're down to, we've got meters and degrees on the same scale here, which is always nice to see, you know, about uh, you know, 0 0.2 of a degree variance in orientation and a few centimeters. So pure visual localization, 24 hours a day, over about a year, over about 1,000 kilometers. So that's OK. Um, and you know, we've, we've, we've processed it relative to GPS, uh, RTK GPS as well, just to ground truth that. So, and in a, in a warehouse, we're getting down to about a millimeter. So, but that's, you would expect that, because cameras are really good, right? They're really good bearing measurements, so that's not so surprising. We tend to think about localization response and performance in terms of things we sort of somewhat humorously, I think, called the graph of hope, okay? Um, it doesn't matter if you're not localizing every other frame. It matters if you don't localize for a kilometer. So I could have 50% dropout and not make it. So we tend to do our graphs as what's the probability of driving more than X meters uh, or without localization. And when we bring the whole thing together, we have about 0.001% of driving more than 10 meters without a localization on pure vision. Uh, anywhere, whatever the weather. And it runs on a, uh, a pretty small machine. So this is an NUC machine, and it's, you know, this is, this is commercialized now. So that's good to go. I like this one too. This is visualizing a PDF. You don't often get that. So we ran closed loop for about five days in a city on the pavements with, with, with crazy children uh, running around. And, and what we've done, we're driving the same route. So the cracks in the pavement here, uh, when they're all alpha blended together, should all add up. Yeah, so they should all be a Delta Dirac. And so this distribution, it was a brilliant way to present a PDF, hard to do in a paper, um, but uh, is the sort of the distribution of errors we're getting. So you can see we're down on the centimeters. This is like something like 20 videos all superimposed on top of each other and they're all aligning. Okay, so, you know, but can we make life easier? So this is the thing uh, out driving in, in uh, fully autonomous, uh, you know, just using vision only in heavy rain, uh, in snow, that was pretty exciting on the top. So what can we do to make life a little bit easier? So I'm going to introduce some work from Aurea Porav uh, here about thinking about how can we work on those, uh, those, uh, those experiences to make them a little bit easier to work with. How can we come up with fewer experiences? So should we learn new feature descriptors? We could do that. Should we come up with some monolithic way of localizing, for example, PoseNet? Or could we use something with, with cycle GANs? And we started to think about how could we transform the images that we're seeing into a new kind of image that's synthetic that makes localization easier. I mean, maybe what we could do is we could transform all images into the canonical uh, experience that's never really been experienced, but which all images match to. And we're getting somewhere on there. So I'll explain this in a moment. So this image down the bottom here is synthetic on the bottom right. So this is the memory image, this is the live image. This image here is this image transformed to make it most like this image. So the distance between the bottom two images should be less than the distance between on the top two images. And I love the way that you know, it's synthesizing where the snow is. So that snow is synthetic, okay, which is quite nice. And here, it's removed the reflections from the rain synthetically to make it like the one at the bottom. What else have we got in here? Okay, and it's making the images rainy there. Okay, so how do we do that? So uh, the idea here is we use a, a cyclic GAN. So what we want to do is we want to learn a transformation that goes to a new style. So here we're going from day to night. So we learn that transformation. And then we invert that transformation and you should come back to where you started from. But we're doing one different thing. We're not just trying to make the images look like snow or look like sun. What we're trying to do is also Make the images such that when you run the surf detector, you would get the features that you would want to get if you were matching in daylight. Yeah, so we're actually learning the transformation such that the feature extraction that we're going to run on it is optimal for the localization task. So we're not just doing style transfer. 
and that makes quite a big difference. So here you go. So here we're trying to match between day and night, okay? And it's a bit tricky. When you do the transformation and you convert from nighttime to daytime with the surf cost in there as well, many, many more blue lines. More blue lines, good, okay, as a rule. The color of the line's not important, okay? Um, and here are some other uh, transformations. So nighttime today at the top there and day to night. I particularly like day to night. I like the fact that it picks up that the window should glow orange. It's quite nice. Um, not that the orange is important because, of course, don't forget it's the feature types that are actually... This is, it's, it's a, you're looking at this as a byproduct of as, as you as a human uh, that you like these images. But really it's trying to convert the surf features to this canonical representation. Um, and, you know, this is the worst case you can get. So if we weren't doing any of this crazy stuff of this transformation, you can get lost for like a kilometre. So if you're trying to have just a daytime memory and you had snow at night, you can get lost for a kilometre and we're down to about 120 metres using this approach. So again, this is the corner cases. These are the really hard cases that you have. Um, and next, you can imagine we're going to start dealing with, len uh, with water on the lenses. Um, uh, it's just a sort of precursor of what's coming here because um, that bottom there, that's synthesized. So the rain at the bottom there, that's synthetic. So that's the top image with rain being synthesized on the top as we're starting to train how we do that. Okay, um, so how are we doing for time? We're doing all right. Okay, so um, when the world's confusing uh, and it's moving around you, what might you do around that? So that's another corner case. So bringing up some work here of, um, of uh, uh, Dan Barnes and Will Madden. So this is here where we're starting to learn about ephemerality masks. So when this vehicle, when this bus moves in front of us here, okay, most of the world moves. Where's the bus? There you go. And can you see our visual odometry at the bottom? It says we slide sideways. Okay. So what we're doing here um, is gonna, we're going to learn an ephemerality mask. So take a mono image. Can we learn what part of the image is sliding past? Um, and we will blank that part out. And because we have this localization system that's so good, down to sort of millimeters, we can run through a world again and again and again and again, and we can produce extraordinary training data because we know where we are to a few millimeters. We can build 3D maps, and we can basically do a kind of differencing on disparity and build up great training data unsupervised to build a deep net that will learn an ephemerality model. So given a picture, it doesn't know it's a car, it's a bus, it's a duck. It's just, it's just stuff that could move. You shouldn't be trusting that. And that makes a huge difference to us. So now we have a visual odometry system that a filter goes on those images and says, by the way, don't put any features or any localization features on the stuff marked in red because it's going to be sketchy. And that's made a big difference for us as well. And again, this was these edge cases. We had this great system until there was a giant bus and it pulls off and you think you're moving backwards. So uh, again, I think this, this, this stuff makes a big difference. But what if you can't use vision? Okay, so what if it's in a dust storm or you're in a blizzard? Okay, it's absolutely torrential rain. What are you going to do? And I think the great unused sensor for these corner cases is radar. How many people have used radar? Yeah, it's quite hard, right? Sometimes I say it's like drinking from a fire hydrant with gravel in the flow. Um, uh, and, and, uh, uh, which is a good experience, right? Okay. Um, let's not get too negative. So, so I'm working with a company called Navtech. They're downstairs. Phil Avery's here. You should, you should look them up. And they make a, what I think is an absolutely wicked sensor. Look at this. Okay? That's uh, somewhere. Uh, I think that's a street. But there's extraordinary qualities about radar. First of all, it sees through water. Okay? So torrential rain goes straight through it. Dust, straight through it. You can see up to 800 meters. Absolutely extraordinary. And it has some really interesting properties to it. So you can see here, see those markings there? So I've got multiple reflections. I'm going to pick something here. OK, so here and here I've got multiple returns. Here I've got some ringing, but there's definitely some structure here as well. So how can, how can we deal with that? I would like to be able to build a localizer that works with that kind of data, because then I don't have to worry about any weather conditions. They're all going to be fine. I can go through dust, I can go through heavy rain, snow, it's all completely fine. Okay, so looking here at how the radar looks, um, I get a range, so I, I see out like 800 meters and I get a bunch of bins and I get energy in each of those bins. It's not like laser that I get a first return. But I can get multiple returns as well, so that can become a bit tricky. But actually, it's the detail on the texture, it's the fact that I saw that crack on the pavement and the window and I saw through the window and the truck and the grass behind that makes this interesting and much more like a fire hydrant. Um, 
So there is some thinking on multipath, and what Sarah Chen did on the multipath was looking at the wavelets of each of the peaks, because if you get a multipath and it's bouncing backwards and forwards, the frequency, the spectral signature, and the temporal signature uh, around that peak will be similar, so you can, you can remove those multipaths. So how are we going to do these associations? If I had a radar scan and another radar scan, how might I do these associations? You cannot do ICP because if I moved a meter, a bottle top suddenly flares and it's the most important thing. It's a huge signature. Move another meter and it's gone down. So you can't do anything like ICP. And so, so what Sarah suggested that we do is to start to look at the pairings between features. So the distances between features in one scan should be the same as those associations in another scan, if you get that right. But that seems really hard. That seems quadratically hard to do. And it is, but there's some literature on how you might do this. So we're going to build a giant matrix, which, which is always good. Um, and the, uh, every one of these elements, this theta, that is the distance between something in scan one and another thing in scan one. And what that distance is, think of it as meters for now, but it could be any sort of feature distance. And I'm going to enumerate all possible pairings between one feature in um, scan one to another one in scan two, down each of those columns. And then I'm going to come up with a compatibility with each of those pairs. So each of these elements in that matrix is going to be the compatibility between one pairing in one scan and another pairing in another scan. It's not point to point. It's the relationships intra-scan between the two of them. And then I want to find out what's the maximum coherence that I can get between all of those choices across all of those enumerations. And, and then you can pretty clearly see that you can write that down as a, sort of a, as, a, as a quadratic cost, where M is an indicator that says, yeah, that is an association between one feature and another feature. And if you make that discrete, it's pretty hard, but if you relax it and you go between 0 and 1, that becomes a much easier problem. And, and by inspection, you can see that this is maximized when you find the prime eigenvalue of, of that cost there. So, so what we need to do is fill this big matrix up and take the principal eigenvector of this guy and you have the associations. Okay? And the principal eigenvector is easy to do because this is positive semi-definite matrix, so the power method is going to work for you. Um, and extraordinary things happen. So there's that data again, which looks pretty hard. And on the right-hand side there is the relative pose, so that we have now radar odometry coming out of this. Um, and this is as good as visual odometry, which is quite extraordinary, over thousands of kilometers. Um, yeah, well, no, about 1,000 kilometers you've run it on. So uh, to get really, really bad weather, we went to Iceland. And here is Iceland. Um, it was absolutely extraordinary, and uh, it was a big effort to mobilize a team to go to Iceland. Um, and we had terrible blizzards and coldest winter ever in the UK. And in Iceland, they had the best visibility they'd had for 42 years. <laughs> this is not normally visible. So we'd planned going up this glacier. Um, and I think visibility was something like 310 kilometers. Um, <laughs> That is a hard task, text to receive um, from the guys. The view from the volcano is awesome. OK. <laughs> How's your admin? Um, OK. Um, so everyone should go there. But you know, so, uh, so we ran this in, in, in Thor's boulder field. Of course, it's called Thor's boulder field. Uh, uh, quite brilliant. This is quite hard. Look at the top. So the vehicle's pitching and rolling around, and we're still managing in the system here to be able to pick out our, our ego motion as we move through. Uh, and at the bottom, that's in some scrubland. So I'm you know, picking this up. I really, really do think that radar is the great unseen sensor at the moment in doing this. And Sarah's done a, a great job on that. Her talk's next. So you should go and see that. And, and here you go. Here's comparing radar odometry for those cases where, don't forget, you cannot see anything. Imagine those cases, it's a pure dust, it's a snowstorm, the radar will be absolutely fine. And what we've done here is to make you feel like you've got a headache when you're reviewing the paper is, is, is time shifted. The, uh, the, the odometry, the RTK GPS, and the radar to show you get the same sense. Because otherwise the graphs are completely over the top of each other. And obviously when you run it at night, the VO fails. Um, but interestingly for that same sensor that we would run in uh, outdoors at 800 meters we run inside a power station disused we managed to find a disused power station near us 
only in England, um, and, uh, and that works really well indoors as well. So we really are thinking about this, this radar as, as a generic sensor. And it's very different to an ADAS radar. Um, and here, again, is a superimposing over uh, uh, an RTK GPS feed as we go around, uh, around Oxford, and you really can't see those differences. But if you zoom in really closely, these are the kind of errors that we're getting. So you get these small jumps, and that's because we're assuming that the radar is taking a snapshot, and it's actually not. It's actually spinning as we go around. It's running on a helix. But I really think... For these corner cases, radar is a thing to do. So conclusions as I finish, I think the tricky cases fascinate. I've always been interested in getting outdoors. It's brutal, uh, unless you go to Iceland. Um, uh, um, and those tricky cases, those corner cases, are really where I think universities should be working. Um, uh, and there's, there's really interesting stuff to do there. Uh, judicious use of deep learning amplifies metric methods. I, I'm, I'm not a buyer in, the, in, in metric from the beginning. Um, uh, and DL throughout. I think there's a, there's a really interesting play to be made, and some of the stuff that Ori is doing, I think, shows to that. Um, I think if there are many ways that we should be thinking about cleverly labeling our own data, because to learn is one thing, but to teach is harder. Um, so clever teaching of these methods, I think, is something that robotics can really bring to the field instead of having to have hand-labeled data. We should think about that a lot. Um, again, radars like drinking from a fire hydrant with pebbles in the flow, but I do think it is the future. I really do. I think we should spend more time looking at radar. Um, and no one modality rules. I mean, I've, you know, I've gone through a bit of laser here. I've used vision. I've used mono. I've used infrared. I've used millimeter wave radar. Um, so no one modality rules, and that does make it hard for PhDs. OK, because you've got to build system stuff, and I'm sorry about that. Um, and of course, the obvious truth is that everyone needs to go to Iceland. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank you, Sarah, Horia, Dan, and Will. You're all here. It's amazing to be able to work with you. And the Oxford Robotics Institute is a, is a fab place. Thank you. I've talked to a lot of people to work here. Thank you as an audience, and please ask me things. Thanks for a nice talk. So for the experience-based navigation, your motivation was that you don't want to have a single representation for the same place, right, that represents day and night. In your gun setup, you're basically learning a transfer from one image to the other. So the features in your gun, isn't this your magic representation then that could represent the place under all conditions? Yeah, that's right. So what I want to do is reduce the number of, of experiences that we have artificially without having there just to be one. And so exactly right, that we're, we're trying to... We're trying to produce uh, the GAN to produce a transform such that the features that appear in a transform image are maximally attractive to all other images. So really think about this as a filter that every image goes through that will try and map it to one of, hopefully, just one experience or one of N that gives us the minimum number of experiences that we needed. But if we needed seven, that's fine. Thank you. Um, in all the localization that you have talked about, um, we are addressing the problem of not missing uh, places, yeah. not, not missing loop closers. But uh, maybe the hardest problem is actually declaring false positives. Um, and actually, the methods that we know so far, or ha I have seen, to declare or to reject those false, uh, false positives, actually, uh, they work on global metric consistency to, to reject them then how do we handle that we are only local and yeah. or how we produce actually the false positives that are the okay. key ones? Okay, so I think you're asking how do you not teleport yourself around this graph? Okay, so yeah, so, so the, the loop closing thing, um, we kind of got a handle on from the, the fab map and extensions of that. So we get very, very few uh, um, false positive loop closures. And often we're, we're not doing the slam thing here. We're not randomly going out into the world and trying to build that map. We've been through the world once or twice and localizing, and we're building a representation that allows us to localize. Okay? So the false loop closures are extremely rare. And you're right about the geometry. We do just check on the geometry. We're localized in a graph. There are only so many places that we can be near that. And so the geometry is a very, very strong check. What we sometimes get is jumps by 10 centimeters because we're picking the previous node or that node there and the geometry becomes a little bit sparse, but it's a, it's a very rare problem to get those false loop closures now. Very rare. Other questions? He's just gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking about uh, combining a question. My question is, can you combine the GAN work with the radar work and perhaps recover an underlying representation from which you can predict what the radar signal will actually look like, but the underlying representation undergoes an SE3 type of transformation as the current. So, 
So I've thought about that, and the thing I haven't got my head around is how to leverage my knowledge of the physics of that radar in there as well. So you know that radar's chirping, you know what multipath looks like. I would like in the GAN to be putting some physics in there well, because I know things about how these things vibrate, I know things about the spectral components, so yes, but I wouldn't want to go, here are pictures of radar, step back, and hope something good happens. Okay, I would want to put some physics in there, because it's the physics that's making that radar work so well. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, the cycle GAN work is really impressive. The results are really nice. Then you're doing matching, feature matching in that pixel space. That seems very expensive. Um, have, have you compared this to matching in, a, in the feature space directly, um, in the, the uh, network feature space, uh, or in a latent representation instead? <laughs> Yeah, we, play, we played with lots of architectures uh, in, in doing that. Um, runtime is quite cheap, so it's quite expensive to train, but at runtime we've got a forward network that transforms all the images. The trick, the hard thing for us, is figuring out at the moment, we haven't quite got the canonical representation, so it's actually style transfer, so we have to know that we've got to go from day to night or night to day, and we'd like to kind of get rid of that as well, so it's, it's kind of by itself deciding for this nighttime image, this is the transform that you should be taking it to for those feature spaces for a differentiable surf. So one of the things we've done is made the feature detectors differentiable in there. Um, I think there's quite a lot of work to be done at the moment. There's a there's a I was a little bit disingenuous in there because you do have to decide which transformation you want. And we've got a bank of what, ten or so transformations that we have. So and those are all separately Yeah, and they're all separate, which makes you feel a little bit unclean. Other questions? Um, hi, thanks for a great talk. Thank and uh, so I wanted to ask one one more thing about the style transfer, or not the style transfer, the like the surf feature transfer sure. gun. Uh, the thing is that in your talks you're always saying that you want to be like really good in all the weather, like wherever and so on. The the question <laughs> here is, does it mean that you will have to retrain for all the new places that you see, right? So you you have now ten different things that you need to pick for your gun. Um, Basically, like from day to night, from night to day, yeah, and so right. on, and it's going to be for the for all the places, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. That's what. So at the moment, that makes me a bit sad, um, because you, although you might have drastically reduced the experiences, you still need to know which transformation to make. Okay, so I'd really like to get this to the Canox. So all. All images go to some unseen, never seen by a human canonical representation that's probably, I suspect, low gray cloud diffuse lighting, okay, um, with, uh, you know, with motion blur removed. You know, there'll be something canonical that this thing learns because we're doing these transformations for the localization. So absolutely, and, and we're, we're, we're not there yet. I, I mean, Hori and I are having a conversation whether such a thing even exists or whether you should have a bank uh, of these. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll bet there is a canonical. <laughs> Hold me to that. Okay. Okay. So probably one last question. Yeah. There is. Yeah, there's one at the back there. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering uh, what the generalization capabilities of this type of uh, feature style transfer looks like. Because usually for all of these types of uh, learning procedures, the generalization is usually a problem. So I'm wondering if you've tried in, in enough cities to say that this is uh, uh, general enough to be used, or if you're actually using it in, in uh, the training data that you're using. Yeah. Um I mean, I guess I guess we've 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 tried it on on thousands of kilometres, but it is an English city, so I haven't tried it. But I've tried on all the different weather conditions. So you're right in the sense that there could be something about the architecture, uh, the kind of features that be in the architecture. But there is quite varied. You know, we're through parkland. So um, the answer is no. I haven't tried it on all the data sets. Um, but I don't see any impediment to what we've done. Why? Well, just thinking this through for you. Your, your answer straightforwardly no. Haven't tried it on all cities, but it is fairly diverse. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just straightforward what we've done at the moment. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you, Gav. Yeah, real time. pleasure. Thank you.